God is good. All the time. All the time. God is good. Amen. It's, it's good to be back with you. We left so early on, uh, on Monday morning. I'm not even sure if that was considered Monday morning or if that was still considered Sunday night. Uh, spent, as I said before, about six days uh, with our Envision team in Miami. Got back yesterday. And even though, man, I haven't missed like a gathering with you. I haven't missed a Sunday with you. It just feels... Like we've been gone for a very long time. It's sort of like we started going about a week ago and we just haven't stopped, haven't slowed down, haven't really had a chance to, to rest much or, or get caught up. And just, Jen, are you as exhausted as I am? I'm exhausted. I am wiped out. So I've uh, been praying through the morning that God would uh, give me strength, that he would uh, uh, renew me. And I believe that he is, even through just being around all of you and being in worship, and he's giving me a renewed strength and, and uh, just enabling me to, to bring the word to you this morning, and I'm uh, just thinking, as we were singing a scripture, was coming to my, my mind from Revelation, where it says, uh, blessed are the dead, and in this, from this moment on, uh, for their deeds will follow them, you familiar with that line, and I was thinking about uh, everything that went on the last week, and we were surrounded by a lot of brokenness, and a lot of poverty, and a lot of sin, and a lot of hardship, but also uh, a lot of beautiful work for the kingdom of God and, and bringing together uh, diversity uh, within the body, not just uh, not just ethnically and geographically and everything that goes along with that, but giftedness that God was kind of piecing together, even on our team of like eight people, just the, the, the variety of giftness that Jesus was weaving together and the spirit was enabling us to work together for the mission of the gospel. And um, I was thinking of that, that scripture about their deeds will follow them and uh, just thinking about our brother Bill Torek, his birthday uh, today, um, and thinking about the hand that he had in, in getting us there last year with everything that went on with our first mission fest. And he was really a major force behind that and that raised all of the funds that sent us to Miami to do all of that work that Jesus was preparing for us to do. So I uh, just want to uh, just say a word of, of, of thanks to Jesus and uh, thank him for our brother again for his work. Uh, that is continuing in. And I, I know that not only uh, do our deeds follow us more in the Lord, but as does the reward. And I just pray that, uh, that some of that is still rolling in for him, that the work continues uh, even in his absence and his presence with the Lord. Uh, we're continuing on with Second Peter. I almost feel like preaching something entirely different right now, but I'm not going to trust in my exhaustion that I'll be able to articulate something that well. I wrote this before I left for Miami. Uh, we're picking up right where we were in, in 2 Peter. It's chapter 2, verses 10 through 22. Um, we're continuing. We had a nice kind of gap, and I was thankful for that because this is a very heavy, uh, very sometimes strange text. So you're going to see some of that this morning as we kind of pick back up. It's all on false teachers. It's all on warnings for the church, uh, what to be on the lookout for with false teachers, how to be aware of them. And I was happy that we had sort of a break because 22 verses of that is extremely heavy and that's a lot to take in. So last week we had Pastor Arnie with us dedicating Reese and, and we were able to, to look at what the Bible says a little bit about fatherhood and, and kind of take a little bit of a segue. But we are going to go back. As I said, it gets a little heavier today. You're going to see that. We want to turn our focus back to 2 Peter. We're continuing this series we've been working on called Living in the Light of Our Coming King. Uh, so find your place with me, if you would, 2 Peter chapter uh, 2, beginning with verse uh, 10. And uh, as you find your place, would you stand with me in reverence to what God has spoken? Uh, we're going to back up just a little bit as we begin. I'm going to start us with verse 9. Uh, just for a little bit of extra context, especially since we've had that extra week in between. So, uh, 2 Peter chapter 2, we'll start with verse 9. This is the word of God. These are the words of God, given to us by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. We ought to receive them as such. The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation, and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment, and especially those who indulge the flesh and its corrupt desires and despise authority. Daring, self-will, they do not tremble when they revile angelic majesties. Whereas angels who are greater in might and power do not bring a reviling judgment against them before the Lord. But these, like unreasoning animals, born as creatures of instinct to be captured and killed, reviling where they have no knowledge, will in the destruction of those creatures also be destroyed, suffering wrong as the wages of doing wrong. They count it a pleasure to revel in the daytime. They are stains and blemishes, reveling in their deceptions as they carouse with you, having eyes full of adultery that never cease from sin, enticing unstable souls, 
having a heart trained in greed, accursed children. Forsaking the right way, they have gone astray, having followed the way of Balaam, the son of Beor, who loved the wages of unrighteousness. But he received a rebuke for his own transgression, for a mute donkey, speaking with the voice of a man, restrained the madness of the prophet. These are springs without water, and mists driven by a storm, for whom the black darkness has been reserved. For speaking out arrogant words of vanity, they entice by fleshly desires, by sensuality, those who have barely escaped from the ones who live in error, promising them freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. For by what a man is overcome, by this he is enslaved. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and are overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it, to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. This happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit, and a sow after washing returns to wallowing in the mire. Heavy text this morning. Say it with me if you believe it. Grass withers, the flower fades, but the word of our God stands forever. forever. Amen. Whoever's ears to hear this morning, let them hear. Let's pray. Our Father and our God, we stand before your word with thanks, and we ask once more for your illumination as we look to it. May your spirit teach us. May our minds be attentive. May our hearts, God, be receptive. May our lives be effective for the kingdom of our Christ, the kingdom of our King. Give us great discernment from the warnings of this text, even this morning. We will leave here like we came. In Jesus' name. So, this is Wilhelm Voigt. In October of 1906, this man was a, an out-of-work German shoemaker, and he cobbled together a secondhand captain's uniform from a couple of thrift shops. He went and he pieced together a military uniform, and he made his way to the local army barracks over there, and uh, he found four soldiers and a sergeant, and he just he came up to him, bold as anything, and just said, come with me. And they followed him, and he dismissed the commanding sergeant, told him to report to his commanding officer, and he rounded up six more soldiers from a shooting range, and uh, they hopped a train, and they went to a town called Copenhagen, it was east of Berlin, and he marched them over to City Hall, told the soldiers that he banded together to watch all the exits, and he went into that building, and he arrested the mayor and the treasurer under the suspicion of crooked bookkeeping. And he confiscated all the funds in the municipal, uh, the municipal treasury. There's about 4,000 German marks. So in our uh, kind of uh, money today, it's about a quarter million dollars, quite a lot of bit of money. Rounded all that up. He ordered those soldiers to arrest those guys and, and take them to Berlin for interrogation. And as they're doing that, and, and he's commandeering a couple of carriages and sending them off, he slips away while they're following his orders. And he finds a public washroom. And he disappears for a minute. And then he comes out as an anonymous nobody with that uniform tucked under one arm and a bag full of money tucked under the other. Behold the parable of the false teacher. They pretend to be what they aren't. They get people to follow them. They put people in bondage. And they usually pocket an alarming amount of money while doing it. Quick word on verse 9. This is a part we, we looked at this before, but I want to include it just for context in our message this morning. This is a reminder of where we've been. Two things are in focus for us here. Two things. Remember this from a couple of weeks ago. We have the inevitability of judgment. The inevitability of judgment and the keeping power of God. That's, that's where we left off. And to kind of repeat what I said as we close that day, the judgment of God, understand this, the judgment of God is inevitable. It's coming. No matter what, it is coming. The judgment of God on sin, the judgment of God on nations, the judgment of God on this world and anyone outside of Christ, it is inevitable. But it is not inescapable. Not so long as there's still time to repent. Not so long as there's still time to put our faith in the promises of God. Peter, uh, earlier in this chapter, he used Noah as an example. And 
you, you realize Noah is he's building this ark. It took quite a while. The, the scholars have tried to estimate just based on sort of what we're told in Genesis and, and the timeline and the age of his kids. Well, how long was Noah building? And they figure at least a few decades. A lot of the best estimates say about 50 years it took him to build this giant ark. And everybody's kind of wondering, you know, what is he doing? Well, the scriptures say that he was a preacher of righteousness. We know that Moses is he's preaching during the time when he's, he's building this boat, he, he knew what was coming, he believed what was coming. The fact that he is building this boat is demonstrating that his faith is sincere, that he really believes what God told him. And so he's, he's preaching. Peter actually called him a preacher of righteousness. And yet what we know from Genesis is that not one person, nobody, outside of that guy's immediate family got in the ark. Everybody else didn't listen. They heard him. They had to have heard him. He had to have been something of a curiosity, building a giant boat, preaching about a giant flood that's coming. But nobody listened. At the same time, though, anyone who would have, like anybody that would have heard his message, who would have trusted what God was saying through him, would have just put their, their faith in the provision that God had made them and gotten into this ark, anybody that would have done that, they wouldn't have died. They wouldn't have drowned. It doesn't matter how sinful they would have been until that point. That, that God would have called him righteous for believing him and in receiving the mercy that he was offering. He would have declared them righteous, in fact, by faith. And, and it's the same way today. Look at the world around you this morning. It is the same way. Peter's going to go on to talk, and we'll get there, not today, but sometime soon. He's going to go on to say in chapter 3, he brings it in with the context of the flood, the great flood that people made. They're not even going to forget that this even happened. He says there's another judgment coming, that God is not going to flood the world again. That's the promise of the rainbow, that he's not going to flood the world again. But that he is going to judge the world in fire. Peter tells us that even the elements are going to melt, that this is sure, that this is inevitable. And even today, there's, there's still preaching, there's still warning. And there's only one way of salvation, and it's Christ. So we've got the inevitability of judgment, it's coming. And we've got the keeping power of God that he's able to judge and he's able to say, be sure of that. There's a reminder of his faithfulness there and the hope of everyone believing. The word says, God made him who knew no sin to be sin on our behalf so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So that sinners like you and me would be called righteous, would be made righteous. But now Peter's turning back to the unrighteous. That's the, the shift again in this chapter. We had sort of a little bit of a hopeful message, a reminder for us of God's saving power. And now he's turning back to the unrighteous, particularly here. He's continuing to talk about these false teachers that he's been writing about. So he says, The Lord knows how to rescue the godly from temptation and to keep the unrighteous under punishment for the day of judgment. Verse 10. And especially those who indulge the flesh and its corrupt desires and despise Authority. He's, he's painting a picture again for us of what these false teachers look like. <coughs> I want to talk to you for just a, just a minute about the law of the harvest. Keep your place in 2 Peter, but turn over with me to Galatians chapter 6. We're just going to look at something real briefly. Galatians chapter 6. Give me some amens when you get there. Amen. I looked down at verse 7. In fact, repeat this after me. Let's, let's do it this way. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say part, you repeat part. Do not be deceived. Now it's when you need to repeat after me. Do, do not be deceived. Do not be deceived. God is not mocked. God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, whatever a man sows, this he will also reap. This he will also reap. All right, he, he goes on. He says, for the one who sows to his own flesh, he writes, will from the flesh reap Corruption. But the one who sows to the Spirit will from the Spirit reap eternal life. These, these false teachers that, that Peter is telling us about, they indulge the flesh, he says. They are sowing to the flesh. You go on to read what he's talking about in verses 12 and 13. He's going to tell us that they're going to reap destruction, that they're going to suffer wrong as the wages of doing wrong. They're not going to get around the law of the harvest. It's God's law. So they indulge the flesh. You can head back to 2 Peter. That's the first thing he tells us about these false teachers. False teachers are people that indulge the flesh. Second, they despise authority. They hate it. They despise authority. Well, what, what kind of authority? Peter's not real specific. 
If you remember, we looked at this last year. He wrote about authority in his first letter. Remember, there's a two in front of the title of this book. This is the sequel. Go back to 1 Peter chapter 2. Let's remember what he said. Verse 13. 1 Peter chapter 2, he says, Submit yourselves. And notice he doesn't say for their sake. This is important. Submit yourselves for the Lord's sake to every human institution. Which ones? Every. All of them. Just the good ones? Doesn't say that. Just the ones you agree with? Doesn't say that. Just, just the ones you voted for? Doesn't say that. It says every human institution. And since it says for the Lord's sake, what's the implication? The implication is that when you don't submit to those institutions, you're not doing it for the Lord's sake. When you disobey, when you won't submit, it's not just that authority that you're dishonoring. It's ultimately God that you're dishonoring. It's God that you're defying. And if it's not clear enough in this verse, Romans 13, 1 says, there's no authority except from God. That which exists, they're, they're established by God. They come from God, they're established by God. To Peter, again, he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. He says, every human institution, whatever institution of authority that you're living under, that is ordained by the sovereign will of God for purposes that he intends. He's going to glorify his name somehow through that. He's going to do you good if you're with him somehow through that. Even if we can't see it, he sees it. He plans it. He says it. And he tells us, to submit to it, the only exclusion there, and we ought to not be looking really for exclusions, the only exclusion there is when you can compare what some authority in your life is saying with what the Word of God says, only then are you free to buck that authority and submit to the Word of God and submit to what God has said because it is better to obey God than man in that instance. And even then do it graciously. That is an opportunity for you to minister, to shine the light of Jesus into uh, whatever surrounding that you're in. Very next verse says, whoever resists authority has opposed the ordinance of God. God is very serious about that. Very serious about that. In, in a room full of people with American addresses and a culture that tells you to hate authority, and a sinful kind of flesh that doesn't like being told what to do. We all need to hear this again. Prophet Samuel told Saul that rebellion is as the sin of divination and insubordination is as iniquity. Get this. Idolatry, he says. It's as if it's idolatry. I mean, he, he likens all of that, not submitting to authority. He likens it to false religion. This is... The same God that says hatred is murder in your heart. Remember Jesus' teaching? If you hate someone, it's murder in your heart. If you lust after someone, it's adultery in your heart. <laughs> same God says rebellion is idolatry in your heart. It's like you're worshiping another God. False teachers despise authority. That is the mark of the false teacher. You find a, a, a Bible teacher out there that is constantly railing against authority. It's a sign. They despise authority. I think in a general sense, I think especially in the sense that they despise the authority of Christ over his church, the ultimate authority. I don't know that that's always going to be clear. Peter's warning is that they're wolves in sheep's clothing, right? That they, that they creep in, as, as Jude would say. But the one who died on the cross for us to, to rescue lost sinners and rose three days later and then ascended to glory 40 days later. He's got ultimate authority. When he rose from the grave, what did he tell his disciples before he ascended? He said, all authority in heaven and on earth, all authority has been given to me. That ought to be categorically true for everybody that he purchased with his blood. Those of us that call ourselves Christians, those of us who are living, following him, he's the master of our lives. And his word is the guide to our living, and it's the light to our path in the darkness of this world. And I, if you were anywhere this week, anywhere near the news or the internet, or just watching everything that's unfolding around us, especially in light of the Supreme Court's decision, you saw that darkness. Crippling darkness. There's such a need for Jesus in this world. But these people despise the authority of Christ. They despise the authority of his words. So what they'll do is they will interpret them to mean whatever they need them to mean. Whatever will justify what they're saying. I think that's why you see so many churches these days. And if you really boil it down, they are a weekly concert series. 
and a motivational speech. And they have a lot more to say about money and happiness than sin and holiness. And they treat the Word of God like it's like a fortune cookie. And they just they sort of cut and paste, paste verses together, kind of twist everything around them, just mean whatever they want to, whatever the flavor of the week is, whatever message they want to they bring to people. Paul said the time was going to come when people wouldn't endure sound doctrine. He said they were going to want to have their ears tickled, so they were going to accumulate teachers for themselves. He says, this was going to be rampant. The day's going to come. They don't want to hear the truth. He says they, they accumulate teachers in accordance with their own desires. He said that time is coming. That time's now, church. It's been here, but I think now more than ever before. It's here. If it wasn't already apparent by what he just said, Peter writes, they're daring, they're self-willed. Now the translation says they're, they're bold, they're arrogant. Here's how arrogant. He says they will revile angelic majesties and they won't even tremble. That's pretty bold. But like, what do you mean by that, Peter? <laughs> that sounds kind of weird. Everything up until this point, if you're reading even in chapter 2, all of it's pretty straightforward. They love money, sexual sin, all these marks of a false teacher. And then he gets this, they revile angelic majesties. Like, what in the world does that mean? That sort of seems like a hard left turn in the middle of all of this. What does that mean? He doesn't really explain what they're doing. He just says that angels who are stronger than they are, who are mightier than they are, they won't do what these false teachers are doing. They don't do it. To cross-reference to this, I think it's going to be at least a little bit helpful for us, it's in Jude. You can turn there if you want, and you're only a few pages away in your Bible, but I'll have it on the screen for us too. Jude actually says, you read Jude's very short letter, he almost says word for word the same thing as Peter a lot of the times. And when he's writing about false teachers, he even uses some of the same examples. Verse 8 9, he says, these men defile the flesh and reject authority. That's familiar, right? Here it is. And revile angelic majesties. And he takes what Peter says next, but he gives, he gives us something more specific. Okay, so what's Peter say? He says that these false teachers will do what angels who are greater than them in power won't do. Jude puts it this way. He gives us a very specific example. He says, but Michael the archangel, when he disputed with the devil and argued about the body of Moses, there's a very obscure story for you right there. Michael the archangel did not dare pronounce against Satan, the devil, a railing judgment. You know what he said instead? The Lord rebuke you. Tells us that reviling angelic majesties, whatever it is that, that Peter's talking about here, it's a reference to the demonic, it's a reference to powers, that unseen realm that surrounds us, fallen angels. These false teachers are so arrogant that they will do what Michael the archangel wouldn't even do. Notice he said, the Lord rebuke you. What, whatever Peter's specifically addressing here, remember he's writing to a first century audience. I'm assuming the people that are getting this letter for the first time when Peter's talking about the teachers around you, look at the reviling angelic majesties. I'm assuming that the people that first get that letter, they know a little bit better about what he's talking about in that context. I don't know Nowadays, we have an exact equivalent for that. I think his point is just to show how bold they are. But I think maybe it is a good time to think more carefully about something else that I'll bet you've heard. So I'm going to put this out there and hold it up next to this verse. Do this in your mind. Compare this principle, what you see with what's on the page. See if there's not maybe something here for us. You ever hear someone rebuke Satan? Or bind Satan? Heard that language? I've heard that a lot, many times. And I want to I want to preface this by saying that I think a lot of well-intentioned believers have said something like that at some point in time because it sort of got woven into the collective evangelical prayer language. It's, it's it's what you find next to like hedges of protection and traveling mercies. These phrases that like outside of the way we pray don't make a lot of sense. You don't hear them. It sort of got kind of woven into all of that. You've heard that, right? Does that sound strange to you? That kind of language, binding Satan, rebuking Satan. Probably you've heard that. The idea of that is rooted in Matthew 18. Jesus said, what you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. Remember that? What you need to understand is that the context of Matthew 18, I challenge you to read this, like the context of Matthew 18 is church discipline. What is Jesus talking about? What you bind on earth will have been bound in heaven. He's talking about putting someone outside of the church for continued 
unrepentance, for continued disobedience. When the elders of the church are dealing with someone within the body who's in sin, who's not repenting, who's been warned, who continues to uh, walk in unrepentance, he's talking about putting them outside of the church. He's saying, Jesus is with you. If it comes to that, that if you've walked in accordance with his word, that if you followed what he said in this journey, that Jesus is with you, that that's, that's the context of the binding. Satan's not mentioned there. He's not mentioned in that chapter with what Jesus is talking about. But I've heard people who, you know, devil, we, we bind you in, in this and that and, and fill in the blank. And again, I understand the heart behind it. I understand the intent of that. I don't think it's exactly what Peter's talking about, about this willful arrogance. I don't get that. When I hear people praying that way, that I don't think that's exactly what he's talking about. But I've heard people just in, in even charismatic circles that will have full-on conversations with the devil. Like sometimes even in the midst of praying, they'll just start talking to him and, and giving him orders and I mean, if you think about it, they're talking to the devil about God when they should be talking to God about the devil, right? It's like you're reversing it, especially when you're in the context of prayer. Prayer is the power for the believer, right? The power is in prayer. The power is in Jesus. That's why when we read about the armor of God in Ephesians, we're talking about spiritual warfare. It is always in the context of praying. So just, it's just the word of practicality. I think for the church. It's not exactly what Peter's talking about, but I think it's a good instance to bring that out. If Satan comes and knocks on your door, just ask Jesus to answer it. Ask him to get it. If you're going to want Satan dealt with in some area of your life, if you want his influence to go, ask the Lord to handle him. I don't recommend attempting what the scriptures say a supernatural angel doesn't attempt. I can't recommend that. The Bible gives us what's wise and what's best. And if, if there's an example for us about something anywhere in the scriptures, I think we need to follow that as best as we can. So again, I, I just, I want to put that out there. I want to say compare that practice with what the scriptures say here and what they say in Jude and what they say in Matthew. Because I don't know that that's something that we're called to do. I, I think the careful approach would be to say, Lord Jesus, would you bind our enemy here? Jesus, would you rebuke him? Resist Satan, yes, yeah, scriptures say that. Resist Satan in the power of the Spirit. Counteract his lies with the truth of God's word. Stand on that. Greater is he who is in you than he who is in the world. Amen. The promise is that he will flee from you. But I have not found a chapter and a verse yet to support what I see a lot of people doing. I think it's worth paying careful attention to in light of this text. Just an aside. Back to Peter. Again, what, why is he going there? What, what was the point? What is Peter really talking about? He's using it to demonstrate how bold these false teachers are. That they so despise authority that they will rebuke, that they will balk at spiritual authorities, at powers that are greater than anything earthly. And he goes on to describe them a little bit more. You think his words sound harsh here? Listen to this. He says their sin isn't even a secret. Sometimes he calls them, listen to what he calls them, unreasoning animals, stains, blemishes, Accursed children. It's like, come on, Peter, don't hold back. Tell us how you really feel about these people. So you're right. This is a long chapter of just a lot of that. It's harsh. But he's harsh because this is Jesus' bride that's at stake. You know what Proverbs says when it comes to dishonoring a man's bride? That jealousy enrages him. That he's not going to spare in the day of vengeance. The proverb says about you dishonor man's bride. The Bible talks about the day of God's vengeance. Again, inevitable. It's coming. He's not going to spare. You read Revelation. He's not going to spare. Peter's going to get to that shortly. So the question becomes, do you think that Jesus is less passionate about his bride than any one of us would be about our bride? I don't think so. He's fiercely committed to her. His apostles were fiercely committed to her. You see that with what Peter's saying? Paul writes to the Corinthians, he says, I'm jealous for you too, with a godly jealousy. See, in his goodness, God does not tolerate things that keep us from experiencing the fullness of his love. He doesn't tolerate things that lead us somewhere else. I don't think it's coincidental that when you read Ephesians, and it talks about Jesus, and this is this a wonderful text, Husbands and Wives. Jen Dave, we're getting into this a little bit in the premarital counseling. We'll dive a little bit deeper into this uh, next time around. He's talking about husbands and wives and what our relationship is supposed to look like in marriage and how it really pictures Christ and his church. And it talks about Jesus purifying his bride and it says he's going to present her. Look at the language. Without stain or blemish. 
It's the same words that, that Peter uses, and again, Paul writing in Ephesians, Peter writing in 2 Peter. Same Holy Spirit is inspiring both of them. Same word is used to describe these false teachers. Stains, blemishes. He says he's going to remove them in the same way he's going to remove every other stain or blemish. Peter's anger is reflecting the righteous anger of God because what they do in the church is so destructive. And, and look at who falls prey to them. He says they seduce the unstable. Those whose faith is weak. Those who aren't standing on his word because they don't know it enough to know better. If you're weak in the faith, you need to remember that in chapter 1, Peter told us we have everything we need already for life in godliness. We have his spirit. We have his word. Dust off the Bible. Get back on your knees. Start seeking him more. Stop thinking that because at one point in time maybe you prayed certain words in a prayer and you're not doing this, that everything's going to turn out okay because it won't. It won't. This is what Peter's warning against here. These are the people that get enticed. These are the people that get drawn away into sin. It's the unstable who are vulnerable to be enticed and led astray. He says they've got eyes full of adultery. It means they wander everywhere constantly. One of the hallmarks of a false teacher. Look at just like every cult that you can find. And usually there's sexual sin. Sometimes the grossest kind. And they're trained in greed. We talked about that a lot last time. Verse 15, he compares it to a man named Balaam. It's another throwback. Peter and Jude do this a lot. It's a throwback to the book of Numbers. If you want to read that story later, it's 22 through 24 from Numbers. You can read the story of Balaam. He's actually mentioned in eight different books. His name's just like 57 times in the Bible. Think about that. It's a lot. 57 times. And, and really, outside of that original story of Balaam, every time you read about Balaam, it's not good. He becomes something of a, of a proverb. He's a byword. There's this constant drumbeat in the Word of God of don't be like Balaam. Don't be led astray by someone like Balaam. Don't be fooled by them. He was a prophet from a place called Pathor. This is a long the Euphrates River, but here's what kind of set him apart. He was a prophet for hire. He was a for-profit prophet. The scriptures call him a diviner. He called the Lord his God. This is what's interesting. Right? He called the Lord his God, but he's the living embodiment of Jesus' teaching that you can't serve two masters. You can't serve God and money. He chose money. He served money. There's a whole lot of Balaam's today. There's a whole lot of people that are, that are running around that fit that description. They've got their, their private jets, and they've got their massive ministries, and they're on TV all the time. The only difference is this guy, Balaam, actually heard from God. They're making stuff up. We know from at least the scriptures that God actually did speak to Balaam. Anyway, money was his master. Peter calls them springs without water, mists driven by a storm. That, that parallel chapter in Jude says they're clouds without water. You see clouds, we anticipate rain, right? If it doesn't rain, then the cloud was an empty promise. It failed to deliver. We saw that in Miami a couple times this week. We saw the clouds rolling in. We thought, man, it's going to rain. We're going to get cooled off. Didn't happen. Didn't deliver. Stayed hot. False teachers are like that. They appear maybe to be, to be full of wisdom, but they're empty of the truth. They don't deliver on the promises that they're making. In fact, they can't. Here's why. Verse 19. Promising freedom while they themselves are slaves of corruption. These are men that are steeped in sin. And they'll talk a lot about license, how you can, you can live however you want to live, kind of, kind of presuming upon grace that as long as you're confessing Jesus, we'll just live like the world, that everything is, is going to be fine. You can get away with that. They call it freedom. You're free to live however you want. That's not freedom. That's bondage. That's bondage of the worst kind. You know, you know who the hardest people to reach for Jesus are? People that don't know Jesus but claim they know Jesus. The, 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 the religious kind of sounding, religious looking sinners that have some semblance of the God of the Bible or they know a few verses of scripture where they, they've gone to church most of their life, but there's no transformation in their lives. They don't know him. Those people are the hardest people to reach because they think they know him. There's a scary thought. Peter says, they speak arrogant words and vanity, they entice by fleshly desires and sensuality. Listen to this. Those who barely escape from the ones who live in error. He's talking about new believers in particular. Those who have just begun to have a life that's different from the world's. He says, they're especially vulnerable to this. These teachers are confident. 
think of old Wilhelm Voigt again, the German shoemaker, putting on his captain's uniform. He looked the part. He had to have had some kind of confidence or nobody would have followed him to just walk up and say, follow me. But all of it was empty. It wasn't real. And meanwhile, people were being fooled and people were being robbed and people were being put into bondage. And when your faith is weak, when your flesh is weak, and Jesus said it is, Somebody confident coming along and preaching something that aligns with both of those weak faith, weak flesh, they get pretty successful. Most people would like to hear that they can follow Jesus and still yield to whatever their human desires are because, you know, God put those desires in you. You were born that way. If you don't want you to live that way, you wouldn't have been born that way. That's what we'll tell you. I remind that one of the clearest teachings of Jesus was you need to be born again to see the kingdom of heaven. Most people would like to hear that they can live like the world and love the things of the world, but then somehow still escape the judgment of the world. Never mind that the scriptures say the exact opposite of that. We'll close this up. We have three verses left. I'm going to reread these. For if after they have escaped the defilements of the world by the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, getting away from that old life, if after that they are again entangled in them, are overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. Listen how serious this warning is. It would be better for them not to have known the way of righteousness at all than having known it to turn away from the holy commandment handed on to them. Since it's happened to them according to the true proverb, a dog returns to its own vomit. What came out of it, it doesn't know better. It's got strange desires, a strange nature. It just takes it back up. A sow after washing was the first thing that it wants to do. Go find more mud. It turns the wallowing in the mire. Wilhelm Voigt was never a captain. He was a counterfeit. He wore the uniform. He pretended for a while. He was never who he said he was. You go on to read his life, he spent some time in jail. He turned into sort of a weird folk hero. For Germans, they put them on stamps, and he went on to die in squalor and in poverty just a couple decades later. So who are you listening to? That's the, the first question I want you to ask yourself as we kind of apply this to our lives. And again, this is, a, this is a strange and a heavy challenge. How do we apply this? Who are you listening to? I want you to examine not just the doctrine, not just the teaching, but the lives of anyone that you're letting speak into your life. Paul's warning from this chapter is what? They, they don't come from out there. They come from among us. Take a discerning look. Does their identity match the uniform? Who's on your bookshelf? Who's on your TV? What are you inviting into the airspace of your soul? Secondly, does your identity match the uniform? You call yourself a Christian, but the world just keeps entangling you. You say that you know Jesus, but you don't walk with him. Have you ever really been set free from sin? Then maybe you've read that on the page and you've heard it preached, you've heard me preach it a lot. You've sung it, we sung it this morning, who the sun sets free is free indeed, but maybe you felt that at one point in your life and you've kind of felt that freedom. Are you free right now? That's really the important question, isn't it? Are you right now free? Does your life look free? If I talk to your, your husband, if I talk to your, your wife, they say you're free. Or your kids or your friends, the people you work with. If I, if I really was able to show them the reality of Jesus and the freedom that he brings, and says, is that them? Is that, do you see that when they say that you're free? Are you free? You know. It's that place where nobody else hears the noise of the chains. The happiness. Is there a settled disposition of joy in your life? Because you're walking in victory. You're walking in the fullness of what Jesus bled to give you. Don't leave here. And let the last day become worse for you than the first. That's the warning of Peter. Because I know the one who opens prison doors and sets captives free. Seeing you at your worst. Even at your worst. 
He took your place on that cross, hung himself there like a key on a nail for every shackle, for every chain. All you've got to do is reach out to him. Be free. Be free this morning. Father, seal this word in us. Do something new today in us. Think of one who died for us that all things would be made new. We praise you for your spirit. We praise you for discernment, for the word that you've given us, Lord, that, that we're not just ships tossed in the ocean, as James would say, from one wind of doctrine to another, that we're not just wandering aimlessly. You've given us a clear path. You've given us the light of your word. Help us. God, to surrender ourselves to that, to surrender ourselves to the working of your spirit who inspired it and resides within us. Bless us as we go to be a blessing to others.